And let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand your words and help us to uh, be diligent in our study of your words and help us to appreciate uh, <clears throat> what you've done, especially in a matter of salvation. I pray that you'd help us to love your words and love you for it and help us to also recognize how subtle and deceptive, deceptive uh, Satan is that we might overcome those uh, that deception. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Mark chapter 11. <clears throat> okay, today is Palm Sunday. Uh, that's one area of agreement that they happen to get right. Hey, a broken, uh, broken watch is right twice a day. So Palm Sunday is a good starting point, and this week is often called the Passion Week. And so I'm going to go through some of that today, and hopefully uh, this story you've heard many times, and I hope that you enjoy hearing the story about Jesus Christ and a great sacrifice. There are some stories that you hear in life that you'd like to hear again, right? Okay, so this is one. If you want to hear a good story, uh, sit down and talk to my dad about a good story when he's about 14 and he's driving around, and uh, his, his dad told him, if police ever come after you, drive to Uncle Jake's and climb the silo and throw corn down on them. Okay, has anybody heard him tell that story? I love hearing, I don't know how many times I've heard that story. Uh, and so, it's a funny story. That's back, yeah, everything was stone roads. I mean, that was back in 1946 or 47. And uh, he didn't get to Uncle Jake's to climb the silo. He was afraid the cop was going to shoot him. And so, <laughs> but uh, it, it's a funny story. And a lot of them stories of the old days were our real blessings to hear. But this is a story about Jesus Christ, about the Passion Week. And this is uh, Palm Sunday, Mark chapter 11. So I'll read through this. It says, And when uh, they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives. Okay, that mountain is east of Jerusalem. That's where he'd often pray and then uh, meet with his disciples. Now he sent forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye enter into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat, loose him and bring him. Okay, and if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And I'm sure the apostles were said, Okay. Would you bail us out of jail when we get the Grand Theft Auto? Okay, but, okay. And when they went their way, they, they and found the colt tied by the door, without in a place where two ways met, and they loosed him. Wow, well, just like what he said. And certain of them that stood there said unto him, What do ye, loosing the colt? And they said unto them, even as Jesus had commanded them, and they let him go, let them go. Hey, just like what he said. It's like he knew what was going on. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and they cast their garments on him, and he sat on him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Okay, so this is a public announcement of the king of Israel. Public announcement. Now, the Bible is very precise about these things. There's a spiritual application that's really interesting in there, but I'm not going to go into that. The public announcement in Jewish customs that when a prince is declared king, but not king yet, sitting on the throne, you announce it publicly by putting him on a white mule or a, a, a white donkey or a donkey of some size, and then, and then he parade him through the city and say something like, you know, hail the king of the Jews or something like that. Okay? When he becomes king, he rides a white horse. Okay? And the Bible is very precise. When David was on his deathbed and he declared Solomon was going to be king, what did they do? He got on a white mule and he rode him around town and they extolled him to be the king. So Jesus Christ here, it's a public announcement to Israel, this is the king of the Jews. Uh, he coming back, he's going to be riding that white horse. Okay, and this is commonly called um, Palm Sunday, and this one, uh, religion happened to agree with the Bible. Hey, surprise, surprise. Even a blind squirrel finds an acorn once in a while. 
And now we can take this point of agreement, okay, and, and then go to the Bible and find out other things going involved in this week and see the bigness of this week and uh, relive this story about Jesus Christ over and over. Okay, I want to give you some ideas about this story, this Passion Week. And the first one is the laziness and lethargy of man dishonors God. In that, okay, over a billion people on Friday are going to do something to commemorate the crucifixion. But he wasn't crucified on Friday. How can a billion people actually believe that Jesus Christ was crucified on Friday. Now, if you can count, maybe homeschoolers can use your fingers in this one. Okay, if you can count one, two, three. Okay, my, I had a friend and his daughter, was, her speech wasn't the greatest. She said, listen, she can count. And she goes, huh, ooh, wee. And she's about four at the time. But even at that, okay, if you can count one, two, three, you know Friday doesn't work. You just know it doesn't. A billion people just accept Good Friday with zero evidence from the Bible and zero evidence from logic. The math class can teach you one, two, three. It don't work. Now, I'm going to cheat for him. Okay, let's say it was Friday. Let's say he died at three. Let's say we give him three hours on Friday. That's one day. Friday night, all day Saturday, Saturday night, we only have two and two, and one's a partial. You say he rose Sunday morning. Uh, he, it says that they went to the tomb a great while before day, so I'm not going to give you the day on Sunday either. Now, I cheated for you on Friday on those folks, but I'm not going to cheat on Sunday. You're only going to get two and two. Now, you may not know what's right, but you certainly know what's wrong, right? I feel like... Jimmy Carter, was he the one that did that? I don't know. Uh, you know what's wrong. But why do people accept it? One is laziness, and two is they just don't care. And that's dishonoring to God. Why do they have less concern about the things of the Bible than they do about Facebook? Or their email address? Or their computer? Or their job? Or the sport? Why, why they care more about those things than the Bible? I'll tell you why. It's because they don't honor God the way they should. Okay, and so I want to look at that idea, okay, as for religion and many Christians claim Jesus Christ was crucified on Good Friday, but Jesus Christ himself said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that don't happen on a Friday. The Bible defines third day. He rose again on the third day. He defines it right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, verse 13, where it says in one place, the evening and the morning was the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. The evening and the morning was the third day. The third day defined in the Bible is three days and three nights. So we may not know what's right, but we certainly know what's wrong, and I hope and pray that a person says, I think that's important enough for me to research it, because I like to honor Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you're going to discover other wonderful things about that wonderful day that Jesus Christ did for man. So I want to look at that a little bit this morning, about the idea of Good Friday and the idea of Easter. And again, you know, Easter is supposed to be next Sunday, and Easter, what is annoying about it, is that it's a Roman holiday, and the devil gets a kick out of thumbing his nose at God. And the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ should not be associated with Easter, a pagan holiday. The devil gets a kick out of that. Now, granted, I know the Lord reads people's hearts, and the Lord can accept some of those things depending on the heart of an individual. But the basic motive of it was the devil saying, I'm just going to have a little fun with this. I'm just going to stick it to God. And that's what he's been doing for years. So hopefully we come to the Bible and we find out, let's see what the Bible says. If you would, let's try Daniel chapter 9. I'd hold your finger in Mark 11, we'll come back to that. But Daniel chapter 9, this is the prophetic calendar. 
Okay, numbers don't lie. So if you go to calendar, this is a prophetic calendar of the Bible. This calendar of the Bible, or time chart, maybe I should say, uh, is the time chart for the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. It's laid out in Daniel chapter 9, verse 21, specifically 24. And so this is the calendar that the wise men that uh, brought the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, to not the baby Jesus, he was a child at that time, and they came to a house, not a manger. Okay, and uh, they knew the calendar, and they were running it and trying to figure, okay, we're getting close, they're running the calendar. Palm Sunday took place because of this time chart. And it completed exactly to the day. God is very precise about these things. Very precise. And if a person sits down and looks at it, you've got to stand back and say, Wow, what a powerful God we have. Okay, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 21, Daniel had been praying for a while, starting in verse 3. He'd been praying about his, uh, the sins of the nation of Israel. And he's going down, and he gets down to verse uh, uh, 18 and 19, the usual very simple prayer, Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Kick an atheist out of an airplane without a parachute, and he'll be saying, Oh, my God, all the way down. But we don't want to experiment with that idea. While he's praying, Gabriel shows up. Gabriel is one of the two angels in the Bible named. He's got the gift of gab. And he delivers a message. He always delivered a message. He's like a messenger boy. Michael was always beating somebody up. So Michael's smacking somebody around or standing for somebody. And Gabriel's delivering a message. Chapter 921, he says, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel... Okay, he calls him a man because that's how they appear. Uh, whom I seen in a vision at the beginning began uh, being caused to fly swiftly, touch me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me, talked with me, and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Wow, what a tutor. That had been quite a, a private tutor to have. Straight from heaven. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Wouldn't that be a nice message to hear from heaven? Why was it? Why, why, did he, why was he greatly beloved? Well, one thing, he took the Bible seriously. And in the New Testament, that translates into study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, and so forth. You're greatly beloved, Daniel. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So he's going to give them understanding. And here it is, starting in verse 24. Now, we have a great advantage of hindsight. Hindsight's 2020, so we're looking backwards on this. So it's more understanding now because of time. And it's a time chart. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy city. Now, looking backwards on that, we now know 70 weeks is 70 sets of seven years. Jesus summarized it. Forgive a man until 70 times seven. That technically, doctrinally is aimed at the end of the trip. Okay, so that's the idea. 70 sets of seven years, 490 years. When is it done he gives the characteristics to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy. Hasn't happened. Calendar's not done. Who does it involve? Thy people. Who is that? Verse 15. Thy people forth out of the land of Egypt. Verse 16, about 87.5% uh, into it. And thy people are become a reproach. Uh, verse 19, thy people toward the end of the verse. Verse 20, about halfway through, my people Israel. Okay, now we know he's talking about Israel. He's not talking about Americans. Not talking about Italians. Talking about Israel. He says, thy holy city. What is that? Okay, uh, verse 16. 
right in the middle of the verse about thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. Verse 19, right in front of thy people, thy city. Verse 18 in the middle, thy city. Uh, verse 20 at the end, holy mountain of my God. So we know that he's dealing with Jerusalem. How else do we know that? In verse 27, he mentions sanctuary, oblation, sacrifices. That's not the church. So a person needs to really get that. And don't sway from that at all. If somebody's going to try to talk to you, he's saying you're going into tribulation, just smile and say, good luck, I'm out of here. Okay, have a good time. Okay, so this is with Israel. Now, the person or the, the angel that gave that information is now going to divide it up. He's going to take that 70 weeks and divide it up, and he divides it up in three sections. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, there's the starter. Nehemiah 2. That's when that command was given. To build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, uppercase P, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So he divided it two places here, seven and sixty-two, sixty-nine weeks, 483 years. Those 483 years were done, Palm Sunday, right to the day, right to the day. God's very precise about these things. And then he says this, The street shall be built again, the wall, even in tribulous times. That's Ezra and Nehemiah. And after three score, after, after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. Crucifixion. Crucifixion there. But not for himself. Jesus Christ died for God first to satisfy his justice and for man second. To demonstrate his love. Okay, and then it says, And the people of the prince, lowercase p, so this is a counterfeit of the uppercase p. We now know, looking backwards, that's Rome. That's the Roman people. The people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Historically, they did that in 70 AD. Doctrinally, Revelation 11. And he says, destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and at the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There's that remaining week all by itself. So that's how the Bible divided. That's how the angel divided it. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. So somebody is sacrificing again. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That will be Jerusalem being destroyed. So there's the calendar. Okay, there's the calendar laid out for us. Easy as pie. Okay, now this calendar on Palm Sunday, Jesus Christ rode on the colt, the full of an ass. The first time the word colt is found in the Bible is in Genesis 49. And it is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. Genesis 49, verse 10. This is, uh, remember, I taught on rightly dividing the word of truth, and this is how the Bible would be very precise. Genesis 49 is Jacob in his closing years of his life. He's prophesying about his sons and their future, about the last days. And he says in 49, Genesis 49, verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. So Jesus Christ comes through the tribe of Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. In this context, Shiloh is a person rather than a place. Unto him shall be gathering of the people be, binding his foal upon the vine, unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. Semicolon. First coming. Do you see the second coming? Right after that. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Second coming in one verse. Now we see a 2,000 year gap. The writer here did not see that. He saw it together. And the apostles did not see that. That's why they asked Jesus about restoring his kingdom. Okay, if you want to find it, Zechariah, second to the last book in the Old Testament, Zechariah. Chapter 9, verse 9. Here's a Bible prophecy. 
prediction. This is not like Nostradamus or Gene Dixon or any of them, them clowns. Bible very precise. Zechariah 9, he writes about this. He prophesied, he predicted. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king, uppercase K, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Can you imagine some of the new Bibles take those words out? Having salvation. Don't like that idea, I guess. And then it says, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Okay, there's a prediction. In Mark 11 is the fulfillment. Okay, so Mark 11. If you would, go back to Mark 11 and we'll run through this pretty quickly. The prophetic calendar is Daniel's 70 weeks. Now, I want to give you a little bit of the sequence and events of that, of that Passion Week. Now, a person can go to Israel and pretend to walk, you know, and all this stuff. But that that have a Roman flavor to it, and it's kind of annoying. Okay, this was what surprised me in 97 when I went to Israel for the first time. Uh, we're going again in June. But the first time I went, I was surprised how many... Roman Catholic churches bought up these sites and put a little chapel and had a little priest by it. That, that kind of, wow. And when I saw that, it surprised me at the time. Then I got thinking about it. I said, oh, okay, I see why that's happening. Because you've got to have a counterfeit. You've got to have somebody representing, <laughs> you know, the other side. And that's what's happening. Okay, in Mark 11... The agreement is Palm Sunday, Jesus Christ rides into Jerusalem. People are yelling, uh, throwing down uh, the things. The disciples are Hosanna. I mean, it's a glorious event, just a glorious event. So chapter 11, Mark chapter 11 through the end of the gospel will show you when everything takes place. So we can walk with Jesus Christ. This is very important with God because he put it four times in the Bible. When God adds things like that, that is very important to him. So Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 10 is Sunday. Verse 12, uh, verse 11 it says, And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he looked round about upon all things, and now even tide was come. Now this is going to get deep. Sunday evening. Isn't that wonderful? Without Greek or Hebrew, <laughs> Sunday evening. Next verse. And on the morrow, the day that follows Sunday is Monday. So now we're setting on Monday. What happened on Monday? The Lord Jesus Christ cursed that fig tree. He announced it in front of the apostles on Monday. He cursed the fig tree on Monday. And then if you keep reading down, use your speed reading skills until you come to the next word, even or evening. In verse 19, and when even was come, he went out of the city. So there's Monday evening. Next verse, and in the morning. So now we are on Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning. Use your speed reading skills and you keep coming down and you come to chapter 14. Chapter 14. In verse 1. Remember, we're, we're still sitting on Tuesday. Chapter 14, verse 1. After two days was a feast of Passover and of unleavened bread. So if it's Tuesday and after two days, Wednesday, Thursday, is a feast of unleavened bread, that starts Thursday night at 6 o'clock. So now you're going to go back to some Jewish holidays. You go to the Old Testament and a Jewish calendar doesn't start like ours. Ours starts in the dead of winter, January 1. What a dumb time to start a new year. Depressing, discouraging, everything's dead. Why would you not want to start your calendar in a resurrection time in the springtime? That's what the Bible does. That's what the Jews do. Now, they run a lunar calendar, and I ain't got all figured out, but I know they start in the springtime. 
So it would be our middle March, April. So the first day of their month is in the spring, say the first day of spring. On the 14th day is their first holiday, Passover, commemorating the uh, getting out of the land of Canaan, out of Egypt, the blood on the doorpost, the common saying, they painted the town red. Okay, and so you had that, Passover. The next day is the first day of Feasts of Unleavened Bread. It is a seven-day feast. Man, a seven-day feast. That's got to make any Baptist happy, let alone a Jew. Okay, and so it's not the Muslim thing where they fast 12 hours in a day and they gorge themselves through the night and they actually gain weight during Ramadan. No, we're not talking that kind of stuff. Okay, so on the first day of unleavened bread is an annual Sabbath. No servile work. That doesn't mean not any work. No servile means close to stores. No servants working. So that's an annual Sabbath. On Thursday that year was an annual Sabbath. Then two days later, Saturday, that's a weekly Sabbath. And then you come back around to Wednesday, which has been the seventh day of the unleavened bread. That's an annual Sabbath. And then Wednesday or Saturday, an annual Sabbath. Now, what the Jews do is they start a Passover, they go to the Sabbath, they count seven Sabbaths. Down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the 50th day, the Sunday, would be Pentecost. And that's when God officially changed it from Saturday Jews to Sunday Christians. Acts 2. That's where the official change took place. And that's why Paul said in Acts 20, verse 7, the first day of the week, and they gave gifts on 1 Corinthians 16, 2, first day of the week. That's how all that started. Okay, and so that's what he's talking about in in chapter 14, verse 1. That will be the Thursday. Okay, now if you would, in chapter uh, 15, I'm sorry, chapter 14, verse 17, as we read our speed reading skills, we're coming down, we're looking for the word even and evening. Verse 7, and in evening he cometh with the twelve. So that's Tuesday evening. Tuesday evening, Jesus Christ introduces the New Testament at the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. And he told somebody's going to betray me. The apostles questioned themselves. John said, leans over to Jesus, who is it? He said, the guy that's dipping the sop. Sop, get that, S-O-P, son of perdition. Got that? Well, I didn't pick up on that one, Lord. That's pretty good. And so he's throwing all that stuff out there. And then Judas betrayed Jesus Christ because they went to the Mount of Olives and here comes Judas and everything. Man, it's a glorious event as far as the Bible, the way the Bible is so predicting on these things. Okay, so that's Tuesday. All through Tuesday night, they had to fake trial. I mean, they're keeping the politicians up late at night because they got a dastardly deed. That's how they do I think they still do that. Late at night, they do these dastardly deeds at night when everybody's sleeping. Okay, and then in chapter 15, verse 1, And straightway in the morning, that's Wednesday. There we go, Wednesday. Wednesday morning. By 9 o'clock, they've got him on the cross. He's on the cross from at least 9 to 3. The sun rolls it back from noon to 3. Why? Because there was an event that would have blown their minds that God didn't want anybody to see. Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us on that day. Chapter 1542, and now when even was come, because his preparation, that is the day before Sabbath, a person says, oh, gotcha, that's Saturday. No, no, that's a high day Sabbath. John chapter 19, verse 31, go there and look in the parentheses. And the Sabbath that followed was an high day. That takes you back to Exodus 12. That's an annual Sabbath. The Bible is very precise, very precise. And a person that wants to honor God will be very precise about these things. A person that doesn't care, it doesn't matter. Okay, go watch Facebook. See how that's going to do you at the judgment seat. You know, go watch a sports game. The Lord takes these things seriously. Why? Because it involves His Son. And the most glorious offer that's given to man, the salvation of their soul. You see, there's a lady that sat at Jesus' feet. Her name was Mary. There's her sister whose name was Martha. And Mary sat at Jesus' feet and he said, what she's done shall not be taken away from her because Martha was griping because Mary wasn't helping her. 
I'm not discrediting Martha. Martha was serving. That's a good thing to do. But Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. And she learned some truths. And you know Mary anointed Jesus according to the Bible? In the Old Testament, they'd pick out a lamb on the tenth day of the month, and they'd set it on the side. This is our special lamb. This is the lamb we have on the tenth day of the month. It's set aside. It's going to be sacrificed for the family on the fourteenth day of the month. Why? To appease God. Mary anointed Jesus Christ on the tenth day of the month exactly at the right time. She did the right thing at the right time. Why? Because she sat at the feet of Jesus. The ladies that came to anoint the body after the, the death, they did the right thing at the wrong time. We're not going to discredit that. I mean, still, at least they're doing the right thing. It, it, the timing was off. I mean, the car was still running. It was kind of spitting and sputtering, but it got there. Okay, and so this is Mary. And she did that thing just perfectly, right to the T. And the Lord in heaven says that this is going to be a memorial for her. When the gospel is given, not the gospel of Jesus Christ, but the gospel of the kingdom. So you got this thing running through the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross on Wednesday. Down in the Jewish temple was a Jewish rabbi, the chief priest, taking the Passover lamb. Getting the thing ready. Getting ready to take it. He's sacrificing out in front. And he's getting ready to take the blood to go into the temple. And Jesus Christ says, it is finished. And that veil rent in twain from top to bottom. And that high priest that had that blood just, oh! He thought he's going to die. And right down on Golgotha, Jesus Christ paid it all. All to him I owe. And that Jewish high priest, what are they going to do? They can't sew that thing back up. That cloth is about six inches thick. There's no way. And it was torn from top to bottom. There's no Goliath at the bottom ripping that thing. It was God Almighty that established the New Testament that day. What a glorious event that day. And then three days and three, three nights. So you got Wednesday night, Thursday. Thursday night, Friday. Friday night, Saturday. Three days and three nights, just like Jesus Christ said. You said he rose Sunday morning. Yeah, but that's any time after 6 o'clock on Saturday night is Sunday morning, according to the Jewish calendar. Besides, he was long gone early Sunday morning, great while before day. He was so long gone that the soldiers, when they saw the resurrection, they saw the angel and everything going on, they ran back into town, were scared to death, and they talked to the guys with the money, and they said, you go back out there and go to sleep and tell people that the disciples stole them while you're sleeping. And that's what the Jews buy into today. Oh, come on. You mean to tell me you're fast asleep and you're going to tell us what's happening around you? Why did not those soldiers get put to death? They should have been put to death. That was the custom. And who guards a dead body? What kind of an insane thing to guard a dead body? You guard a live body because it can escape. A dead body's not going anywhere. Unless it's Jesus Christ. You can't keep a good man down. And that's a fact. Now, when you look at these things, you've got to step back and say, what an amazing power God has. God will predict some things in the future, write it down, and if man wants to outsmart God, prove it wrong. Try it. Just try to prove it wrong. Kaiser Wilhelm in World War I said, I am going to walk through the eastern gate. The Bible says the next one that walks through the eastern gate is the king, Jesus Christ. Kaiser Wilhelm said, I'm going to walk through it. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. Besides, he's got to dig down through the rubble to walk through the eastern gate because it's buried down in there. Jesus Christ is going to walk through that. Kaiser Wilhelm couldn't, do, couldn't change it. Here's what God does. He'll give a prediction. He'll give very precise prediction. And then he will just throw thoughts in people's heads here and there. And that thing will be fulfilled just as he wishes. Not against their free will. He will use their free will. They will act upon this thought and it come true. On that day of Calvary, it says Pilate was determined to let him go. But it also says God was determined. What was God determined to do? Have the sacrifice of sin paid for. 
God and the devil met at Calvary. The devil, thinking he's killed the Messiah, he's won. God says, he don't know what I've got. I've got a trick up my sleeve. He's going to rise from the dead. And you ain't stopping it, boy. And man was involved with the devil, where man was determined to crucify Jesus Christ. On that glorious day, the sovereignty of God and the sovereignty of man met. And God won. Now, the question is for you is, do you accept that? for your payment for eternal salvation. If you would die right now and was at the throne of heaven, they say, why should you come in? If you'd say, well, I thought it was pretty good. And the angel said, oh. angel sitting there saying, get out of here. And they said, get out of here. Compared to Jesus Christ, you're nobody. You see, the bottom line is what Jesus Christ did. And you look at that glorious event of what God did, where Jesus Christ died to satisfy God's holiness. He was determined. He set his face like a flint. And these guys that try to make Jesus to be emotional about there, man, he had no emotional concern per se. He wasn't worried about anything as far as the cup that he was asking God to deliver from him. He wasn't worried about the pain. He wasn't worried about man. He wasn't worried about what's going on. He was concerned about broken fellowship with his heavenly father. That's what he was concerned about. They've been in perfect fellowship for eons, eternities, and now it's going to be broken because he's going to take man's sin on him. And a person is going to throw H2O on top of that? How deceived are people that they think H2O needs to be thrown on top of what Jesus Christ did that day? You talk about a slap in God's face. That's why what they're doing. They're slapping God in the face. I mean, this offer, Jesus Christ has offered. In Philippians chapter 2, he says, He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And then every knee is going to bend. Every knee. I don't care if you believe him or not. I don't care if an atheist believes him or not. The devil is going to bend his knee someday and he's going to say about Jesus Christ, you are Lord. Okay, now the smart thing is to, on earth, before you die, say, Jesus Christ, you are my Lord. You are my Lord. I'm trusting in you and you alone, what you've done, and I'm going to love you for it. You see, we ought, the Passion Week. You know what we ought to be passionate about? Jesus Christ. That's what we ought to be passionate about. Okay? And so the thing is, is, look at Jesus Christ and what he's done. Glorious event. Nobody can even come close to what he's done. And it's coming through Jesus Christ. And I certainly hope and pray that you have considered him and he is your Savior. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask you to help us to see uh, the bigness of Calvary and help us to Sit back and be amazed at how the devil can deceive people and how people are so lazy in their Bible study. Or they just don't care. They care about other things that are not as important. And Lord, by chance, if somebody in this room right now has never placed his or her faith in Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, Lord, help them to see their desperate condition. They are one heartbeat, one heartbeat from hell. And they can, have, they can be one heartbeat from heaven by placing their faith in thee. Trusting in you and you alone for eternal salvation, for eternal life. Oh, what a glorious gift that's given. And I pray by chance if somebody in here is not saved, that they would recognize their desperate condition. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, the piano will play, the altar is open if you need. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ... If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, we'd be glad to show you that. But we can rejoice, we can rejoice in so great salvation, what Jesus Christ has done.
Lord, thank you for this amazing record in the Bible. The prophecies, the fulfillment, the sacrifice, the glorious resurrection. Lord, I just pray you'd help us to appreciate it, love you more for it, thank you for it, and be passionate about your words about Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.